When it was first announced, there was something about the very existence of Youngblood that felt unbearably grim, and that excited the hell out of me. It had me spinning all these ideas in my head of where the narrative could go from here. I always found the exploration of BJ's declining mental state, his relationship with others as he tried to maintain the will to fight, more compelling than the fight itself. And while I wasn't a fan of the way the new Colossus just kind of ditched that story after a certain point in favour of complete grindhouse schlock, the announcement of Youngblood seemingly brought that aspect of BJ's character back into stark focus. It would seem from those initial trailers that the promises BJ made to fix the world so his babies didn't have to grow up under the Nazi scourge ultimately amounted to naught, with his daughters now having to take up the fight that he seemingly couldn't win, and him struggling to make sense of that fact. It reminded me of the new Colossus intro, and how it always felt like kind of a cruel joke played directly on its protagonist, with its cold opening immediately following the events of the New Order, with a seemingly fatally wounded BJ thinking his job was done, only to be further torn apart by his friends reminding him that he still had work to do, sending him into an existential spiral beautifully illustrated by that game's opening sequence. It was funny to see BJ tearing up Nazis while wheeling himself around, being woken up to grumpily swat at them like bothersome, idiotic flies. It was also poignant though, sowing the seeds of Colossus's exploration of BJ's bodily mental disconnect, as he considered himself a failure, a liability. All the while, his unwavering drive to protect Anya allowed the writers the excuse to forgo lengthy exposition for the sake of Nazi killing action. It was mechanics and dialogue working in tandem to efficiently establish the game's themes in a period of 20 minutes, it was brilliant. This was the kind of multi-layered writing that the team at Machine Games had proven themselves more than capable of over the course of two full games, and that pedigree had me unbelievably excited for what was to come in their most recent release. Unfortunately, as it turns out, that first 20 minutes of the new Colossus has more heart, wit, subtlety and bombast than the entirety of Youngblood's 10-hour campaign, which throws away its potentially fascinating concept in favour of painfully tedious open-world missions that leave the game feeling like a baffling afterthought, and this feeling of disposability is perhaps most noticeable in the characters we spend the most time with, the twins themselves, the wise-cracking, prank-pulling, totally righteous duo this game hangs its threadbare story on. A lot has been made of the cringeworthy banter between these twins, as we repeatedly get treated to the same elevator animations of the pair dancing for no reason, or you hear the same refrain of, this Nazi's toast, and the response, hell yeah, you're slaying it sis, with more than a few critics pointing pointing out how little resemblance this bears to actual sibling interaction. And look, I get it, it certainly isn't how my family would react to situations such as these. That said, I don't think this argument holds much water in this case, we're operating in a heightened reality here, anything goes, and the duo's youthful energy could act as a neat change of pace from BJ's brooding nature. See, this is a series that, through incredibly touching moments of quiet between the schlocky, action-packed missions, has been able to take what initially seemed like unbearably cringeworthy characters and very quickly redeemed them as remarkably complex individuals, as we see them deal with loss, love, survivor's guilt, the wide spectrum of human experience as magnified through the lens of Wolfenstein's surreal post-apocalypse. That said, the problem with the dialogue here is that, thanks to the dearth of curated story missions, outside of three, maybe four cutscenes and sparse idle conversation that seems to come out of nowhere, those elevator scenes, the plucky one-liners that begin repeating 15 minutes into a 10-hour game are the only insights into these characters we get. No comedic irony of BJ ruminating that he's somehow going to die while simultaneously slaughtering wave after wave of Nazis, no subtle relationship development as Fergus's refusal to let Grace win gradually earns her respect. No, thanks to the fact that this game's open approach has to allow for players to tackle its structurally identical missions at any given time, there's no room for gradual character development here. So all we have are the constant shoutouts of <laughs> I'm going to wreck this dude over here that are as useless tactically as they are narratively. And it wasn't just the twins that suffered from the game's change in focus. I was slogging my way through one of the game's seemingly infinite hordes of bullet sponges at a fairly late stage and was genuinely shocked to hear a voice over the radio I couldn't remember hearing before, speaking as if we were old buddies. I think it was one of the many mission givers strewn about what you could loosely deem the 
this game's hub, the catacombs. I knew everyone in the New Order's bunker. I partied with them in the New Colossus. By comparison, I've played through this game more than twice and still have zero idea who any of these people are. These objective spouting automatons that spoilers for the game's loose narrative hook, I guess, after the woefully executed twist that should shake the very foundations of the resistance are less than unbothered. They refuse to react to anything that isn't directly related to the fetch quests they send you on. You get transported to another area, with the writer seemingly forgetting that you could just transport right back. The open world mission structure still had to function somehow, and it sucks because there really is a fascinating story to be told in this period of the new Wolfenstein timeline, one in which the girls try to assert their maturity in a world whose realities they simply aren't ready to face, learning just how liberated this America really is, indulging in the pre-apocalypse delights they were raised without, and importantly, learn about their dad's legacy as mythologized by both sides, contrasting it with the BJ they've known their entire life. These all play into the same slice of life tone that made the previous titles as charming as they were gut-wrenching, and at points we get hints of the game lightly pulling on each of these narrative strings. It's just that the unbelievable thematic potential of said strings is wasted on such a tedious grindfest of an actual game, focusing instead on what most titles would treat as meaningless side missions that here serve as the main event, as you frustratedly run in circles trying to find the one specific path to your vague objective marker, navigating grey street after grey street broken up by the occasional identical sewer or military checkpoint, doing away with the visual flair of prior titles, all filled with quickly respawning enemies that after a while saw me exploiting the abysmal partner AI by simply running to the door at the other end of the room, ignoring all enemies and hoping the sister would transport over rather than get stuck looking at a wall or something. It leads to a situation where a series that previously had me gasping at the sheer audacity of its action as chunks of BJ's enemies cooked on his smoking dual shotguns now had me carelessly fumbling about directly in front of enemies as I cycled through my arsenal because the ammo types didn't match up between my weapon and the enemy's completely arbitrary armour bar that saw me taking on these behemoths before me with the silenced pistol because it was somehow more effective than a massive laser rifle. Giant enemies in prior titles were set pieces, here they're little more than random health bars getting in the way of your purely new numerical progress. And all of this speaks to a wider issue with the game's focus on weapon and character customization. The effects of each weapon upgrade feel so slight in the game's moment to moment encounters that the emphasis placed on these options in terms of level grinding feels like yet more fluff, getting in the way of both the Nazi slaughtering action and a more careful, well thought out story. I don't want to be thinking about DPS in a goddamn Wolfenstein game. The extent of my character customization should amount to whether I want to use one or two shotguns at once. It's worth noting that many of the issues in terms of spongy enemies and the baffling inability to pause while offline will be addressed in upcoming patches, but the things wrong with this game as I see it go so far beyond that. You fix the technical minutia, sure, you have at best a functional, if mechanically unremarkable shooter, but very few of the people I know come to Wolfenstein specifically for its shooting. Many, I would argue, love these games despite the fact you have to actually play them, even though I'm definitely not one of those people. So it's not just that Youngblood is a different type of game that's the problem here, it's that Youngblood takes one of the most narratively bold, rich reimaginings of a franchise ever and uses it to justify some truly baffling design choices. I was fully on board to love this game, even when others were criticising it, I remained steadfast in my resolve to see it through to the end, based purely on the strength of the team's prior work. As it went on though and 10 hours began to feel like 40, it seemed as if every choice made from the basis of the story's broad strokes right down to the details of every single gameplay system was specifically engineered to make me hate my time with Youngblood. As much as it pains me to say it, I've gone from being endlessly excited about any installment in a series that managed to turn BJ Blazkowicz into one of gaming's most sharply written and fully realised characters, somehow catapulting me all the way back around to full blown scepticism about whatever it is we get next to fill in the blanks. So I hope you enjoyed my piece on Youngblood. If you did and want to support the show directly, you can really help out by pledging via Patreon like these wonderful folks currently on screen. These videos really do take a long time to write, record and edit, and it's your unbelievably generous support that directly allows me to keep putting in that time. For that, I seriously cannot thank you enough. 
Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Rob, C. Vass, Artyom Vitsyuk, Bryce Snyder, Tommy Carver Chaplin, David Bjork, Lucas, Hebe Amore, Dallas Keen, William Fielder, my dad, Ali Al Muhanna, Timothy Jones, Spike Jones, The Nameless Guy, Chris Wright, Ham Migas, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Ryan, Justin's Holderness, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.